Uh, so what I want to talk about today is, is the relationship between um, pollinators and, and, and their flowers. And it, I mean, it's a huge topic. So really what the aim of today is to sign of, we're going to touch the tip of the iceberg um, of this relationship. And it's, it's to get, um, it's to get you at home to think um, a little bit more deeply about why these relationships are here and how they work together. Um, and hopefully then when you go and see those relationships out in, in nature, um, they, they'll, they'll be seen in a little bit of a different light perhaps than they were before. Um, so that's the aim of today. Uh, and, and, I, and I hope that you, uh, that, that you enjoy it and, and hopefully you learn something as well. So I just want to touch briefly on what pollination is. I know the vast majority of you here are going to know what that is, but, but to, be, to be sure, I wanted to sort of touch on it. So um, simply speaking, it's the, uh, it's the transfer of, of pollen from, from the male part of, of the plant to, uh, to the female part. So from the anther to, uh, to the stigma. Um, and, and that's fundamentally um, the, a very simplistic view of, of, uh, of pollination. Um, and we can cross pollinate, so we can pollinate between uh, flowers and different plants. Um, that the term cross pollination can sometimes be quite confusing actually, because sometimes it's referred to as between different varieties within, within a plant species, or sometimes it's referred to as the, uh, the, same, uh, the same varieties. But, but nonetheless, it's essentially sexual reproduction. It's the transfer of male gametes from one plant to the female um, uh, uh, area of another. Um, and there's also self pollination. So, so some plants have the ability to self pollinate, um, and that's essentially where um, they pollinate themselves. So the male part uh, of their plant gives pollen to, to the female uh, with the same flower. Um, and that cross-pollination is essentially clonal as opposed to sexual reproduction and cross-pollination. So, and some plants are what we call dioecious. So it's the idea that they have a separate male and female plant. Um, so they have to sexually reproduce. Or there are monoecious plants as well. So these ones have male and female organs on the same, on the same flower. So that gives you a um, sort of a very brief overview of, um, of, of pollination from the, from the plant's perspective. Um, so the next thing I want to touch on is pollination vectors. And, and it's just a posh word really for, for how pollen is transported between, between the flowers. Um, and so you can have an abiotic transfer, so through wind or, or water. Uh, so I'll put a, just a picture here of a, a, a willow catkin. Um, so willows are actually invasive here in, in, in Australia. Um, but they're an excellent example of, of a wind pollinated plant and they produce copious amounts of pollen um, and they utilize the movement of, of the air to transfer that pollen to, um, to others of their species. Um, now that doesn't necessarily mean that they don't have interactions with, um, with animals, um, they, they do, uh, and there's often cases of animals still gathering that pollen for nutritional purposes. But in terms of their reproduction they primarily focus on, on wind pollination. And the main focus of what we're going to look at today is the biotic movement of pollen. So the uh, pollination and movement of pollen by our animals. And, and there's a lovely picture of a, a little Medicali macular reformis there. Um, and bees are, of course, are one of the, um, one of the major pollinator groups and my particular passion. Uh, but we will touch on some other ones as well. Um, and, I'll, and I'll use bees as uh, my major example for some of the relationships. But I also want to draw attention to the fact that they're by no means the only one. And there's lots of other important um, pollinators as well. So the next thing we're going to touch on is the concept of a pollination syndrome. So again, this is a term that's used uh, to refer to essentially the, the corresponding traits between a flower and, it, and, and its pollinator. So for example, um, a flower that has a very long, deep corolla, its pollinator will likely have a very long uh, proboscis or tongue to be able to reach the net tree at the bottom. And so there, it's an excellent example of um, an indicator of co-evolution, the, the generality of these, um, uh, of these correlations across, uh, across the natural world. Um, and so by co-evolution, all I'm, all I'm referring to here is it's the process by which two or, or more, in fact, um, species evolve in tandem. And they, and they do that by exerting selective pressures on each other. Um, so, the, so, for example, if a flower's corolla becomes deeper, pollinators tongue might become longer. That's a, very, it's a simple way to look at it, but it, it, it's a great um, supporter of uh, the idea of, of, of co-evolution. And so an example of that, actually, um, is that a lot of bird pollinated um, plants uh, have red flowers. Now, an interesting part of that is that um, from a bee's perspective, at least, bees don't really see in the red spectrum of light. So they see UV, but they don't see red. 
So they've got a slightly different um, uh, visual uh, spectrum to us. So actually a lot of flowers that are red, um, they're not targeting uh, the, the bees, they're targeting the birds instead. Um, doesn't mean that you won't see bees on red flowers because, because, they, because the bee can see UV, we can't. You know, I often find that if you look at a flower um, in its UV spectrum, it's a completely different image. Uh, and there's lots of evidence for that on, on the internet. If you want to search that, you can see how a flower can completely transform its image by looking at it in the, in the UV spectrum. But another really beautiful example, and I really want to touch on this because it's, um, it's a, an excellent example from history as well, is the idea of Darwin's orchid. So this is a, um, an endemic orchid to Madagascar. Uh, and at the time when, when Darwin was, uh, was uh, formulating his, uh, his theory of evolution by natural selection, he postulated that um, this orchid, which has an incredibly deep corolla, um, would have a matching pollinator with a proboscis able to, to, to reach in it. Now, at the time, the length of that proboscis required was unprecedented, and they hadn't found um, the pollinator. Uh, and in fact, it was only 21 years after his death that the pollinator was discovered, the moth that you see here, and you can see its proboscis is nearly three times the length of its body. Um, and so it's a beautiful example of, uh, of uh, evolution in practice and, and the evidence of that, of, of natural selection. Um, and actually this, this topic with, of, the, of the orchid sparked quite a lot of debate at the time as well. So um, when Darwin postulated that there would be a, uh, a pollinator with a proboscis of this length, um, the argument at this time was there was a lot of arguments about you know, the divine origin of life, and arguably there still is. Um, but a gentleman called George Campbell uh, in 1867, he argued that this was proof of a divine origin because the anatomy was so complex that it couldn't possibly have been formed by anything but a divine, uh, divine being. Uh, and he called that tome uh, the reign of law. Uh, but at the time, it was responded to by another famous naturalist, um, Alfred Russell Wallace, and he actually co-conceived the theory of evolution by natural selection, separate to Darwin, through his own observations and studies. Uh, and he replied with a, um, a paper called Creation by Law, where he explained how this could occur through the theory of natural selection. Um, and of course, when this was uh, shown that it, that it existed, um, it, was a, it was a beautiful um, support for, uh, for, the, uh, for the theory at the time. So after that brief history lesson, um, we're going to go on to uh, animal-mediated pollination, and that's going to be the focus of, uh, of the pollination interactions that we look at. So essentially, this is where the pollen is transferred through an animal vector. You know, we talked about um, biotic uh, vectors a little bit earlier, um, and that's, that's exactly what this is. And, and so the animals and the plants, they forge, over time, they forge relationships together. Um, and actually, it spans multiple groups. And often when we think about pollinators, um, we think about insects, but we also probably primarily think about, about bees. Um, but actually, the relationships with pollinators and plants, they span uh, they span the group. So there's a lovely picture here of um, uh, a grey-headed flying fox smothered in pollen, as you can see, um, and incredibly important pollinators. Lots of small marsupials um, are also incredibly important pollinators. Uh, and the birds as well, we mentioned those briefly. Um, in South America, for example, hummingbirds are incredibly important pollination, uh, pollinators with really close evolutionary relationships with their, with their floral hosts. So it isn't just um, the bees and it isn't just insects, but it is, it is, uh, they are one of the major groups. And the wasps, the flies, the beetles, they also are excellent pollinators and all have their role to play. So although I'll use bees as many of my examples today, um, I also am going to draw attention to the fact that there's myriad different pollinators and they all are important um, in, uh, in, in the ecosystem. So essentially what these, um, what these relations have become, they've become this, this mutual relationship, the idea that there's a, there's a benefit to each partner. Um, and so what I want to really drill down to is to ask the question of why animals visit the flowers. Because if you want to understand the relationship, that's one of the core questions you have to ask. Is that why do the animals go there? Of course, you can also ask the question of why do plants want the animals to come? Um, and we'll touch on that as well. But one of the primary um, reasons that animals visit, visit plants is for nutrition, is for food. 
Um, it's not the only reason, but it is one of the major ones. And we will touch a little bit on some of the other possibilities of why they might explicit flowers later on. But I want to focus on the nutritional one because it is the major one. Um, and so in the case of bees, uh, they visit for pollen and nectar. And that, that, is, that is a nutritional source. So for bees, the nectar is the primary food source of the adult, fuels their flight. Um, and pollen is the primary food source of their offspring. And that's what their offspring develop on. So they go to flowers in order to harvest that. Um, and so through the foraging, through that feeding relationship, the animals interact with the flowers. And so from the plant's perspective, what, we hope, what they're hoping is that they will deposit some of the pollen that they end up getting on themselves at another plant of the same species. So what that highlights is, is that there's different reasons behind the partner of partner's interaction. So the bee is going to the plant in order to gather food, but the plant wants the bee to come to the flower in order to pollinate. So, and so those two different reasons can lead to conflict. And that's something that, that we'll touch on a little bit as well. This idea that where there's conflict, there can be, um, there can be uh, exploitation of, of, that, um, of that relationship. So I want to touch on floral rewards because that's how flowers often entice uh, pollinators to come to them. So whether that be a bee or a beetle or a bird or, or a mammal, it doesn't really matter. They use the floral rewards to draw those, um, those pollinators in. And that enticement is there in order to hopefully pass on pollen um, to, uh, to another flower. Now, nectar is the most common reward and it's probably the one we think of most um, when we think of pollination relationships, this idea that um, a flower offers nectar in return for a pollination service. Um, but it isn't the only reward, uh, and um, many plants actually offer uh, pollen as their reward. Sometimes it's, the, it's in, uh, uh, alongside nectar, but sometimes it is the primary reward. So I've put a picture of a, of a poppy here, um, and although not a, not a native of, of Australia, it is farmed here quite, quite intensively. Um, and po poppy's major reward for, for pollinators is pollen. Now, it's interesting to think about that as a reward because nectar is there purely for reward, pretty much. Whereas pollen, actually the primary function of pollen is to pass on the genes of the flower. They, they are, it's a sexual gamete to be passed on to, a, to, a, uh, to another flower. So there's a slight paradox there because the plant doesn't want that pollen to be consumed. It wants that pollen to go to, um, go to its conspecific. So, Often a lot of these flowers produce copious amounts of pollen in order to achieve that. Um, but it also shows that bees and other pollinators may visit different flowers for different reasons. So, you know, they might go to certain flowers for nectar, but they're going to go to certain flowers with pollen too. So that also adds a little bit of extra complication um, into, uh, into the relationship. But it's by, by no means is nectar and pollen the only floral rewards. They are one of the most common, um, but many flowers produce floral oils as well. Actually, the, bee, the little bee there that you see on the bottom right, um, that's Tenopletra australica, uh, and it's a native to Queensland. And what she does is she doesn't really gather nectar and pollen, she gathers oil. And that's what she uses as her primary uh, food source for her offspring. Um, and beyond that, if we look at the orchid bees of South America, um, and this is a particularly beautiful example, the, the males of orchid bees uh, they do go to flowers to feed from nectar, they need it for, for, for fuel, but they also go to flowers to gather the perfumes from those flowers. And they gather the perfumes from the flowers and then they mix their own cologne out of these perfumes and they use that perfume to attract females. And I think that's beautiful. Uh, what, a, what a fantastic relationship. So there's, so there's lots of, there are other sort of types of rewards that are offered. They're not purely nutritional, although they are majorly, but you can see with the orchid bee there that that gathering those, um, those scents is, a, um, is to aid the male in, um, in, uh, in reproduction. So this is one of the most important questions that I wanted to um, draw attention to. So we said here, mutualism or mutual exploitation. Perhaps that's slightly tautological because they, they're kind of the same thing, but from a, from a, from a mutualism, it's the idea that there's a, that um, in a mutualistic relationship, that there is a benefit to each party that that essentially per capita improves their reproduction or survival. That's essentially what a mutualism is. And pollination is seen as, as one of the, um, the epitomes of the mutualistic relationship. And, and it is, but, but I think we as human beings, um, 
we often view the natural world through the lens of ourselves. You know, we anthropomorphize and we, we add, uh, we're emotional beings and we add that to, to what we see in the environment. And so often pollination is seen as a friendship between um, the pollinator and the plant. The, the idea of, you know, you scratch my back and I'll scratch yours. But that's it's not really true. They're, they're, they're both engaging that relationship. And yes, they both gain a benefit from it, but they're doing it for very different reasons. And they're definitely out for themselves. So the pollinator is out for itself and the plant is out for itself as well. Um, and that's why I've come back to that question of why do pollinators visit plants? Because it's, it's a question we, that we need to keep asking ourselves because that's an important, uh, it's an important way to understand um, pollination. You know, they primarily go to it for food. They don't, uh, for example, a bee doesn't visit a flower to pollinate it, it visits a flower to feed from it. So pollination can be seen as an incidental uh, occurrence alongside um, the, the feeding interaction. And so that's worth understanding because it, it shows that um, they're not doing each other a favor. They're both sort of benefiting from the relationship, yes, but it's not a mutual agreement, if you know what I mean. Um, so the pollinator is looking to get maximum gains and the plants are looking to get maximum gains. And, and sometimes those two things don't coincide and so there's conflict. Um, and I'm gonna talk about that conflict in a little bit as well. Um, but we mentioned floral rewards, the way they entice um, the pollinators in, and that's an area that can, that can be abused by the pollinator. And so because these rewards that the plants offer can be exploited, um, the plants often protect them, not to the point where it necessarily excludes everything, but what they, what they don't want, for example, if you imagine a plant that produces nectar and a pollinator comes along and it consumes all of that nectar and then it flies off somewhere else. So from the plant's perspective, it doesn't really want one pollinator to be able to come and consume everything and then fly away. It wants to be able to give a little bit of a reward, but attract as many different pollinators in so that it can maximize its chance of spreading its pollen to, to other flowers. And so it can add different types of defenses to these rewards. So that bottom picture there actually is a pollen grain. Um, and if you, if you want to look at some beautiful architecture, natural architecture that appears in nature, I implore you to go and just look on Google Images and look for some SEM images of pollen grains. And they are spectacular. They're like, they can look like spaceships and they're incredible. But often that, uh, that architect, that structure that they have, um, can also play a role in uh, the relationship between them and their pollinator. So for example, certain pollens are, are spined or, or, uh, or ridged in a way so that, <coughs> excuse me, so that a pollinator can't gather so much of it. It can gather, it's more difficult for it to pack, let's say. So in a bee, they pack it on their, either on their corbicular um, or on their scopa. So these are the areas of their body that are specialized for, for um, holding pollen. But certain pollen grains are, 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 are structured so that the bee can't gather quite so much or it takes them longer to do it, just so it stops them over exhausting that, that, uh, that resource. Especially as pollen is of course very expensive to produce by the plant in comparison to nectar. They also have toxins in. So a lot of pollens have got toxins in. Um, uh, these secondary toxins that, that, that are in these pollen grains can also play a controlling role as well. So there's been studies done on, um, on bees that have shown that if you raise uh, bee offspring on pure, a pure uh, sample of, of pollen from a single species of flower, that actually it, it, can, it can kill them. Whereas an, an, a separate bee that is also raised on the same diet can survive and vice versa on different pollens. So it shows that um, there's almost an arms race within this pollinator relationship as well. So the plants produce toxins to limit the amount of pollen this, that, that some uh, pollinators can, can consume, but also certain pollinators are better adapted to deal with those toxins than others. Nectar similarly uh, can have chemical defenses, um, but also nectar has a lot of secondary chemicals in it, and, and it's not just the defense. Some of them have medicinal properties, um, and some of them have very strong, strong antibacterial properties as well. Um, but what a flower can also do is sometimes limit um, the nectar available at any one time. And this, this enables it to offer a reward, but not have that reward exhausted by, um, by a single pollinator. So I, I wanted to focus on that a little bit, just because it shows that we look at the pollinator relationship often as pollinator goes to flower, 
picks up pollen, goes to another flower, pollination occurs. But as we dig deeper, we see the levels of complexity within that relationship. They know that the, the, the reasonings behind why that interaction occurs, but also the adaptations of the plants and the pollinators and, and how they deal with, with this relationship and how they try and benefit themselves from it. So I want to touch on now um, the cheats. Um, personally, and I don't know what this is about me, but I really enjoy um, the looking at the relationships between uh, plants and pollinators where one of the party cheats. Um, and I think it's a beautiful highlight of how uh, in nature and, and in these relationships in particular, um, they are very much out for themselves. And so they, they will do, and if there is an opportunity to get all the benefit without any of the effort, they'll give it a go. Um, and so an example of this might be, from the pollinator perspective, might be nectar robbery. So what you can see there on, on the left um, is, is a honeybee. And uh, in this case, she can't reach the nectary in that flower. Um, it's, it's of a, 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 a format that she, can't, that she can't reach. So what she's doing is she has chewed a hole in the bottom of the corolla, and then she's put her tongue through to lap at the nectar. So she's not come in contact with the pollen, She's not spreading any pollen to that plant. Absolutely no benefit to that plant whatsoever. And the honeybee's got her reward. So this idea that, that they go to the flower just to do them a favor, I think this highlights the idea that actually, if, if they can get the reward without extra effort, they'll do it. Um, pollen robbery as well is, is also something that, um, it doesn't see as much attention uh, or get as much attention as pollen as, as nectar robbery, but actually it's, it's thought to be quite a common occurrence um, in in nature. And this is where uh, a bee bees are particularly guilty of this, which is why I'm using them as the my example. Um, where bees will visit the male part of the flower specifically to harvest pollen, but they won't end up transferring any of that pollen to a female part because they're only focusing on the male part and they're very good at getting that pollen off. So essentially they've taken the pollen from the plants without contribution to pollination. So of course from the plant's perspective that's quite a cost to endure. Pollen is an expensive thing to produce and all of that pollen or at least a lot of that pollen is being taken and not being used um, for pollination. But don't worry because the plants won't be outdone. Uh, so there are lots of tricksy plants as well. Um, on the right hand side here, this is the Canberra spider orchid and um, orchids are a very, a very popular group of flowers and they are very beautiful and they often receive a lot of attention because of their beauty and because of their elaborate um, uh, uh, floral patterns. But the reason I like orchids is because they are amongst the biggest cheats um, in the plant world when it comes to uh, pollination. So what this spider orchid does um, is it has a relationship with uh, a wasp. Uh, and we mentioned earlier that uh, nutrition or food is not the only reason why a pollinator might visit a plant. And this is a, this is a manipulated case of this. So there are occasions where um, uh, animals might visit plants for reproductive purposes. And this orchid manipulates that to the hilt. So what this orchid does is it mimics a female of the wasp species that it targets both in physical appearance, but also in the sense it produces. So what it encourages is it encourages a male wasp to come and mate with it. And whilst the male wasp is mating with it, it picks up the pollen and on it goes. Of course, the wasp has been completely duped and completely uh, fooled in this scenario. So the wasp gets no benefit whatsoever, whereas the orchid has got its pollen onto another wasp and it's got a strong possibility that that male wasp is gonna go and mate with another orchid, thinking it's a female and therefore uh, pass on its pollen. Um, and from the orchid's perspective, it also means it doesn't have to produce expensive floral rewards. It just tricks the pollen to do what it wants. So these examples, I think, are a really nice um, uh, look at perhaps the darker side of some of the plant pollinator relationships and how um, they, they can sometimes try and cheat each other. And, and they can do it very well as well. So the next thing I want to talk about is, um, is pollination efficiency. So from a simplistic perspective of pollination, we, we've mentioned that, um, that we have, you know, animal visits plant, feeds, picks up pollen, goes to another plant, and you've got pollination. Um, but, but, but actually there's, there's levels of, of efficiency within that relationship. So um, pollination itself as a whole is quite an inefficient process. Um, so 
very very little of the pollen that a plant produces will ever actually reach um, uh, its its female counterparts. Um, but then within that, when when you're using animal mediated pollination, when you're using the animal vectors, um, certain animals are more efficient than others, and that efficiency can change depending on the plant they're visiting as well. So it boils down to the fact that different pollinators can get than others depending on what uh, scenario you're looking at. So again, I've used an example of bees here because there's there's so many examples and they're, they're a brilliant tool to use for highlighting this. And the picture on the top there is your standard Western honeybee. Um, and she's got, as you can see, her corbiculae there uh, are, is stacked full of pollen. And honeybees are very, very good at gathering pollen, very efficient at gathering pollen. What that means is that the vast majority of that pollen will not be passed on. So the pollen here in the corbiculae, that's being stored and it will be taken back to the hive and that's what they'll use to feed their offspring. That pollen there will, ne will pretty much never be used in a pollination interaction. So the plant has lost that pollen. Um, and so therefore often in bees where they use corbiculae, where, where they have these quite efficient pollen storage areas, um, not as much pollen is always transferred. But if we look at our, one of our solitary bees here, so this is just a, um, a megakali resin bee, um, you can see she stores her pollen on her abdomen, on, on what we call scopa. So that's just, a, it's just hairs on the bottom of her, her abdomen. Um, but this is a slightly messier system. And so it's slightly looser, it's not packed as tightly. So often she'll drop quite a bit of that as she's going around and she visits the flowers. And so often solitary bees, in this instance, will drop more pollen off at different flowers. And so therefore the odds of pollination occurring are higher. So pound for pound, our native solitary bees are often better pollinators. That what the honeybee lacks in, in necessarily individual efficiency, it makes up for in sheer numbers. But it also explains and it, and it gives a good reason as to looking after our native bee pollinators as well. And the same will go for other animal groups as well. Certain groups will be more, will be more efficient on certain flowers. So maintaining that, that, uh, that biodiversity is a really important part of, um, of our uh, uh, pollination ecosystem. So that brings me on to diversity, diversity, diversity. Um, diversity really is king. Uh, and, and I'm sure you'll, you'll have heard this from lots of different sources about lots of different topics that you know maintaining these these diverse um, communities is 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 really important and it just showed me just looking at the images you've got here you know um, you can see we've got a little honey possum at the top and then we've got a monarch butterfly at the bottom and a, and a black resin bee big black resin bee in the middle there's a huge diversity in pollinators um, and the, the flowers that they interact with are also going to change as well and that's going to that's really important so maintaining that diverse group is what is going to allow our ecosystems to be strong and robust and to be able to deal with perhaps changes in environment or other changes that, that are forced upon the system and so what we don't want to ever reach is a scenario where we're reliant on a single pollinator and we, you'll often and this may be a question that someone might be thinking of asking you the I, I often get asked oh if we lose the honeybee are we doomed here in Australia and if we did lose the honeybee tomorrow, we would be in serious trouble. But we must remember that the honeybee doesn't belong here. We brought it here. And so actually what we have done to compound that issue is we have become reliant on this one species at the detriment of our native species around us. We've, there's been a lot of habitat destruction for our native species and not a lot of attention being given to them. So they are now in a position where they're perhaps not able to provide the same backup as they would have done if we'd looked after them. And the same will go for a lot of other pollinator groups. So looking after our diverse groups is actually going to help us hugely uh, in, the, in the future. So this is just a brief aside here. I wanted to touch on buzz pollination because it's a really beautiful example of how some pollinators are going to be good uh, for a particular plant and others are, ju are just not. Um, it's also an example of a pollination syndrome, like I mentioned earlier. So what this is is and it's it's a it's a unique um system that's that's co-evolved between flowers and and and, and their bee hope their bee uh, partners and essentially some plant anthers will not release their pollen or at least very little of it until it's vibrated uh, and so what certain bees have evolved the ability to do is they shake and vibrate their flight muscles and this vibration releases the pollen and allows them then to gather that pollen 
Now, only certain bee groups can do this. Uh, the Western honeybee cannot do it, and our native stingless bees here in, um, uh, in Sydney can't do it either. But a lot of our native solitary bees can. So uh, blue-banded bees, teddy bear bees, carpenter bees, um, they can all buzz pollinate. And so there, if you are interested in your veggies or you grow anything in your veggie patch, tomatoes, chilies, capsicums, kiwi fruits, eggplants, courgettes, pumpkins, the list goes on. All of these are buzz pollinated. Um, and so maintaining these populations of pollinators um, is a really important, uh, really important thing to be able to do because they are the only ones that can pollinate certain groups. So just to sort of uh, finish up, I want to touch on a couple of other pollinator groups uh, that, other than just the, the bees that, are, that have been, uh, been the focus. Because although bees are a very important um, pollinator and they do have some of their close relationships with plants, they're by no means the only important one and there's lots of other ones out there. Um, and so I'm going to look today a little bit at wasps and a little bit at flies. And so wasps, for example, also, they're not just good pollinators, but they also have the dual role of being fantastic pest controllers as well. So although the adults primarily feed on, on nectar, um, and so these are the, it's the adults that are going to be involved in the pollination interactions, their larvae are often are carnivorous, and so they often are fed uh, on pest species. And there are certain plants out there that are only pollinated by flies, and there are lots and lots and lots and lots of flies as well. So it's worth remembering they play a role uh, too. So I want to just sort of touch on one group because there's wasp is a huge group, but I want to just touch on the flower wasps. And the main reason is, is that they're quite common visitors to our gardens and they're also quite beautiful as well. Um, so they, you'll spot them. So the picture you've got here actually um, is commonly termed as a, as a, a blue ant, um, but it's not an ant, it's a, it's a flightless wasp, the female in particular. Uh, and the bottom picture there is, uh, is the male of that same species, much more wasp-like in, in, in appearance. Um, now, these are common visitors to our gardens, and, and many of you will probably have, have seen them before. Um, and the adults, they, they do feed um, on, on nectar, but the offspring are carnivorous. And so what the female will do is she will dig around and search for uh, larva, often beetle larva, and she'll sting them, and then she'll lay her eggs on in them. And uh, the Larva will develop on that grub and essentially eat it alive. Uh, so it's quite a quite a gruesome uh, relationship, uh, but but an important one for, for pest control. Um, now, as you saw from the image on the other slide, you know many of these um, wasps are flightless, but but not all of them. Um, so this is just a, a blue flower wasp here on the right hand side, um, and they're quite large, metallic, um, brightly coloured uh, coloured wasps, um, and You'll have, I'm sure many of you will have seen them flying around. Um, and they've mentioned that, that they have that role uh, in pest control, but the adults are the ones that are going to be um, involved in, uh, in, in pollination. Um, and although they can sting, the wasps can sting, they, do re they rarely do so. Um, with these solitary wasps, and they are, they are very docile. Um, and unless you're, you know, you're very silly and, and try and handle one, um, then you'll be absolutely fine. Um, but the flower wasps are just one group, you know, they're just one group. Um, the bottom image there is the hairy flower wasp, for those of you who are curious. Um, but they are just one group of wasps, and there's lots of different types. But the idea is to just bring your attention to the fact that they are important and they do play a role in pollination. But also that for any of you who are, you know, who are keen gardeners out there and you struggle with, uh, with certain pests, actually your wasps are, are, are some of your best friends when it comes to, uh, when it comes to controlling these. So the last group I just want to mention is the hoverflies or, or the flowerflies, as, as some, some of you may know them. Um, and they are amongst the most common um, uh, visitors that we see to flowers. Now the adults, they feed on, on nectar and pollen, um, but the, the larvae are actually also really great pest controllers in many instances. So I put an image at the bottom there of um, a uh, hoverfly larva, which is on your left, and a caterpillar on your right. Now, as you can see, they look quite similar and, they, and they, people confuse them for each other. Um, and they may try and remove the, what they perceive as a caterpillar, seeing it as a pest, but actually the hoverfly larva there, it consumes aphids. So it's an excellent friend to anyone who, who is a gardener uh, and it'll keep those aphid numbers down. 
The way to tell the difference is that um, the uh, hoverfly larva is a, is a, is a true maggot, uh, whereas you can see in the, um, in the uh, caterpillar there that it has those, those, little, those little legs along there. You won't get that in the, um, in the hoverfly larva. So the great thing about both hoverflies and wasps is by, by, by acknowledging them and, and, and having them in your, in your, in your garden or in our, in, our, in our bushlands, they're not just doing the pollination, which is great, but they're also helping us with the pest control as well. And so that, you know, the idea that, that nature is naturally able to control you know, different groups of, of organisms. So having these in your area is definitely, definitely a good thing. Also, for those of you who like chocolate, uh, which is myself included, uh, you should be very grateful to the flies. So this picture on the image on the left there is a, is a chocolate midge, uh, and it's the pollinator of the uh, cocoa plant. So all our chocolate essentially is in thanks to the relationship between this midge and, and its plant host. Um, flies are also incredibly speciose. So here in Australia, it's predicted that there's 30,000 of them. We've only actually described six. So if there's anybody out there who's interested in finding a new species, you've probably got a good chance um, if you're looking into flies. Um, and, and actually, they can be very cryptic as well. So I put this image here on the right of a, of a fly, and you can see it's quite hairy. Uh, she's smothered in pollen, uh, and you know they, it's quite bee-like. Um, flies often mimic wasps and, and, and bees, uh, often in order to, to be to look more threatening than, than perhaps they are. Um, but with a fly, they do tend to have smaller antennae, uh, not like the long antennae of, of, of wasps and bees, um, and they actually have two wings rather than four. You might not think of a wasp and a bee having four wings, but actually what they have is they have the, the larger primary wing at the front, and then they have the rear wings that are attached by little hooks um, onto, the, onto the, uh, the top wing. So they actually have four wings. Whereas a fly, its rear wing are replaced by something we call a haltier, which is essentially like a, um, a gyroscopic organ, which allows them, it's, why, it's how flies can do those really complicated area, area batics, basically. Um, and they do that through using this that, uh, that adaptation. So just to finish, a little bit of wasp fly or bee. Um, they are quite difficult to tell apart sometimes, um, and there's some general pointers. They don't always apply, but it's a good way to, to look at them. So a bee has branched hairs um, and would normally have pollen-carrying uh, morphology, so a scopa or a corbicular. Um, obviously not necessarily so present in the males, but in the females they will. Um, a wasp has unbranched hairs, and it often has a narrow waist as well, although some bees do also have that. Um, and it won't have any pollen carrying um, morphology with it either. It also, they also often have what we call a marginate eyes. So they're eyes that wrap around the base of the, um, uh, the antennae, which bees don't tend to have. For a fly, they've got that, those shorter antennae, um, very large compound eyes, and the two wings that we mentioned rather than four. So to go around these images here, uh, the image on the top left there is a fly. Um, and you can see it's mimicking a wasp, and it does it very, very convincingly. Uh, the image on the right is actually a bee, so that's Nomada hacella, um, and looks very wasp-like. Many of the bees in Nomada, the genus, actually look very, very wasp-like. Um, and the bottom image there is, again, the hairy flower wasp, um, which many made mistake um, for a bee. So hopefully now, when you go out into your gardens and you have a look and, uh, and see what's flying around, you might see some of these cryptic species. Um, and, uh, and perhaps even for what they truly are. So that's my talk. I hope that um, you've learned a few things, but I think more importantly, what I, what I wanted to do was really pique your interest in, in these relationships because we've only scraped the surface of the complexity of these. Um, you know, there are tomes and tomes and tomes on these relationships and there are thousands of academic papers that look and that research this and it's still a really strong area of active research because we, we know comparatively little about how these relationships work and what we do know is often limited to quite a few uh, numbers of species. So um, it's, and I really enjoy that because it means there's always something new uh, to learn. So thank you very much for listening and I will answer any questions that I can uh, that you may have.
Thank you so much, Alex. That was, was really fascinating. It was in some in some ways it was hard to keep up. We were giving us so much information. I was trying to take a few notes, and I guess everybody was a bit like that. But the uh, the great news is that the uh, webinar is recorded, and if you, if there was bits that you felt like like for me, I might want to go over it again. Um, uh, okay. it, it's going to be, it'll be up on the website um, on the council website before long. So um, thank you, Alex. Um, we have got a few questions, and I've got a couple of my own. Um, I'll just uh, run from the first one was from um, Vicky actually. Not so much a, a pollinator question, but um, Vicky was curious about the that you mentioned solitary bees and she's obviously not heard of solitary be, be, bees before. And so she's just asking, I wonder if you could just quickly describe the difference between or or what a solitary bee is um, with in relation to a bee that lives in a hive. Yeah, of course. So um it's a very common um, uh, question that, that we get asked, this idea of oh, what do you mean by a solitary bee? Um, because we think of bees as often the honeybee, we think of a social you know, group, but actually sociality in bees is the exception, not the rule. So the vast majority of the 25,000 species of bee in the world are solitary. And so what I mean by that is, is very much as it, as it suggests, they live on their own. So each female is reproductive, uh, she builds her own nest, uh, and she lays a series of eggs within that nest and she looks after them herself. Um, so that's essentially, that's the, the major difference between them. A lot of solitary bees are also, um, unlike uh, honeybees, there's no generational crossover. So as in, they uh, they come out in spring, they provision their, their nests, and then they often pass away in the winter and their offspring come out the next spring and so on and so on. There's lots of variation within that. Um, you know, there are, there are lots of bee species that sort of sit somewhere in the middle where there's uh, under certain conditions they're solitary and under certain conditions they're social. Um, and there's some that have primitive social um, actions. Uh, but the primary difference is, yeah, is that in a social hive, um, they, they work together and there'll be a, a laying queen. Whereas in uh, solitary bees, each female is her own reproductive um, queen, essentially, uh, and she produces her own offspring. Yeah, thank you very much. And Vicky, you might like to hop on to the um, Kuringai Council website and have a look at um, yeah. a couple of Alex's previous uh, webinars, which talks about bees. And one of one of the ones uh, one he did was um, on um, hotels. So that actually talks about solitary bees and their requirements too, doesn't it, Alex? A little bit. But, yes. Yeah. yeah there's, yeah. there's lots of info in there for. Yeah, there's uh, lots of information solitary. on that. Thanks very much for that question. Um, We've had another question regarding a, a, a good field guide for insects. You know, you were talking about there's a lot of mm. information being yeah. out there, Alex, and there's a lot on the on the internet. And you're saying it's uh, a huge no, topic. No. Is there something so, that people could use? Yeah. So, from I, I know most about field guides from the bees' perspective, um, and I would say the best one is uh, it's called a Guide to Native Bees of Australia, and it's by Terry Houston. Uh, if you just type Terry Houston into Amazon, you'll find it. Um, can you hold it up? Have you got that there? I can hold it up. Yeah, have there it, it is. Just, people have a quick look. Backwards. Okay. Um, well, that's, a, that's a really good field guide to, um, to bees. Uh, Terry Houston is one of the, the godfathers of bee biology here in Australia. So, <clears throat> excuse me, it's an excellent book. And uh, he doesn't just look at um, the identification of bees in the field, but he also goes through their life cycles and their evolution and uh, a lot of other aspects of bee biology as well. So I highly recommend that as a, well, as a field that, guide. That's... When it comes to the other groups, um, I have to admit, I can't think of a wasp and fly one off the top of my head, um, but I would imagine if you follow the same publishing, uh, so this is CSIRO. Uh, if you go on to CSIRO and you look at their guides, um, anything on there is, is worth its weight in gold. Thanks very much. Okay. Well, um, we have also um, one of the attendees is uh, from the Blue Mountains and was um, impacted by the, the bushfires last year. Um, they, they, they say that the whole area is still trying to regenerate. Um, and the question is, what impact will these fires have on the native bee population? Uh, I think we can... A million dollar question, that, isn't it? <laughs> no, I um, think we So... It will affect different bee species in, to different magnitudes. Um, so, of course, the loss of the floral resource in the area is, is, can be devastating, um, but often that's more temporary. The, the flowers will often recover quite, quite rapidly. 
sometimes the actual biggest effect of bushfires on bee populations is the loss of their nesting habitat. So this isn't from the Blue Mountains, but it's a good example of a, of a bushfire affected bee community. Um, if you look at the uh, emerald carpenter bee, which is one of the biggest bees in Australia, um, beautiful bottle green metallic uh, integument, beautiful. Uh, they, as the name suggests, they chew their nests into um, uh, old banksia trunks and uh, grass tree stems. Now, in, on, there's a, there was a population of these bees on Kangaroo Island, uh, and they've been the focus of a conservation effort for quite a while. The fires last summer devastated Kangaroo Island, and a lot of the habitat that these bees would use for nesting has been destroyed. That nesting habitat takes many, many years to develop. And so, because these species are essentially annual, there's a strong risk that bees will never come back to the areas that have been destroyed without our help. Um, so we do see a lot of attention on the news, um, you know, about the uh, many of the mammals and the birds that are affected by bushfires, and, and rightly so. But we don't see as much about the insect community in general um, or, or bees. But there is a really strong possibility that in these areas, they may struggle to repopulate with certain species of bees that rely on some of this mature um, nesting habitat uh, to nest in. So if you're interested in looking at that type of thing, um, I would advise looking at Katja Hogendorn. She uh, works at University of Adelaide and she is leading the conservation project on, um, on Kangaroo Island. Uh, and they've done some fantastic work. And you're also very lucky if you're watching us in Sydney that we are one of the last bastions of the green carpet. Uh, and if you head up to the Kunga National Park, um, you'll get a good chance of seeing one. Mm, thank you. Yes, I, I looked on the, the, the pollinator uh, website because, as you probably know, it's Pollinator Week in November from the 8th to the 15th. There's a very good website with some more information. They talk about the um, green carpenter bee. Um, <coughs> they actually say, because it's extinct in um, South Australia and Victoria, but they failed to mention that it, uh, it still exists in Sydney. And we do have some in Karingai. Um, we actually saw some when we were out walking the other day, didn't we? Um, which was very yeah. exciting. But there's two very closely related species. Um, uh, it's uh, bombalans, which is so like xylocopa like bombalans. Um, so that's the uh, uh, we get that here in New South Wales and sort of up towards Queensland as well. And then um, aureus, which is the species that exists on Kangaroo Island, um, comes just about as far north as as, as Sydney. So we have a, a very unique uh, area where the two populations cross over. Mm, mm. Fantastic. Uh, I don't know if you're going to be able to do this one off the top of your head, um, Alex, but which pollinators are you? Yes, it's a bit like that rapid fire, you know, um, Norman Swan <laughs> yeah. on the Coronacast. Uh, which pollinators are your favourite species? Top 10 in Karingai. It's a bit of a tough oh. one. Tough <clears> one. <throat> That's a cruel question. <laughs> it is. Because I feel, like, I feel like I can't win. Yeah, you might um, have to prepare an answer and post it on the website. I mean, yeah, obviously I'm biased because I do, I do love my bees. Um, but I would have to say my, my fave, my favorite at the moment, I'm going to, I'm going to hedge my bets. My favorite at the moment, um, is our reed bees. We get them not just in Kuringai everywhere, but, um, reed bees are small, maybe sort of five millimeters. Um, they've got bright red bums and they, you'll see them sometimes nesting in the top of bamboo canes. And they're my favorite because they have a remarkable variation in their ecology and the way they breed. So there are solitary groups, there are uh, social, uh, uh, primitively social groups, they share nests, um, and they're a choose a button to boot as well. So they're probably my, probably my favorites at the moment. But I swing back and forth all the time. Every time I see something new, I think, oh no, I really like that, that's my favorite, or I, you know, I swing between them. So, um, I know that's probably not a uh, the answer everyone was looking for, but yeah, I I'm always changing my mind about which one I like best. Okay, thanks very much. Well, I hope that helped. You might, if you might have a think about it and send some more. We have had a question yeah. about you doing um, a follow up presentation about just purely on other insects, not just bees, but other insect pollinators. Um, I have I've replied to that person saying, well, not next week, but uh, we'll ask you to <laughs> to consider it. You, um, Alex is actually flat out at the moment. It's uh, it, for those of you who don't know, it's the it's the busiest time of year for uh, the bee program. We're splitting. 
uh, hives. We've started in September and we're, we're splitting the hive. So we're out in teams. Logistically, it's, uh, it takes a, a lot. So it's really uh, terrific, actually, to have Alex presenting today because normally he'd be out in the field um, splitting hives. Um, quickly, another couple of questions. Um, <coughs> Oh, um, Alex, I know you have some native beehives that you were selling and giving to people in Sydney. Well, we're fostering them to people in Karingai. Um, do you have any green carpenter beehives that are available that could be divided? I mean, well, they don't. So the, so yeah. the, the green carpenter doesn't work that way. Um, yeah. So uh, it's, it's, not, um, it's, not, it's not a social bee. It doesn't produce a hive. Um, and it essentially creates its own, its own nest each year. Um, there are things you can do to support them, but um, they, they're very choosy about where they nest. So um, if, you look at, if you look at some of the conservation efforts that have been done in, uh, in Kangaroo, on Kangaroo Island, they've used, uh, essentially, it's a balsa wood um, stalk that is used to mimic the stalks of uh, grass trees. Uh, and that enables the carpenter bee to chew its way into the balsa and it makes a long um, a hollow inside and it nests inside there. <clears throat> but anecdotally from speaking to a lot of the other scientists that work on, on this bee, um, they'll only go for that if there's nothing else. So they'd much rather go for the natural uh, stuff. And because of, what, because of the nesting habitat that they use, they do tend to hug the fringes of the national parks. So for example, in Kuringai, I've seen um, the green carpenters in North Terramurra, uh, St Ives Chase, uh, and some of the other uh, fringe areas that, that go onto bushland, but I haven't seen them further south in the LGA because they tend to stick towards that area. And presumably that's because um, they've got a supply of nesting habitat there. So, um, you can definitely look at you know the uh, the designs for the artificial nesting substrate for green carpenters and give them a go, uh, but their uptake is is um, is, is not great. Uh, it's still you know it's still something that we're scrabbling to um, to, to learn and uh, doing our best to to support this species that's that's really um, really facing some tough times. Okay, so I'm just um, madly uh, typing some of the questions to people, uh, answers to people that are not uh, directly related to the pollinating. So, um, somebody, people asking about the uh, beehives, Alex. So I can I can answer those ones. Okay, directly. So <laughs> no, no, no. I, for those people that are waiting for responses, I'll just type type one back in. Um, but uh, maybe I can tell you all um, actually that. So the, I did mention that we are splitting at the moment. Uh, that will continue until the end of October, possibly early the November. Uh, once those hives have been rested for about six weeks, um, we will be ready. Uh, in a position to, to distribute them. But as you know, this year is a lottery. Um, I believe that over 600 people have applied so far, uh, which is pretty amazing. And we, so um, you've got about um, a one in 10 chance. Would that be right, Alex, if I worked that out properly? Yeah, it'd be around about that, yeah. So, so about a one in 10 chance of, of actually receiving one. It's going to be, it's, it'll be a randomized um, uh, selection we'll just sort of like spin a wheel and pick out those people. Um, but yeah, it just, show, the, the, it just shows you how popular the program is. It's doing, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's great for Karingai, but um, it is too popular. We can't, too popular to give, to let everybody foster a beehive, but those that are in the lottery have got a chance. Uh, so has anybody else got any other pollinator related questions? Uh, because uh, we really have been going for about an hour now. Um, it's been terrific for everybody to stay and I hope you've got a lot out of that. I think Alex, if, if anybody has any more questions, they can um, email you, is that, is that right? Yeah, yeah, so my email address is there. You know, feel free to, to shoot something along. Um, I, no, I normally get back to people within 48 hours. At the moment, it might be a little bit longer, just because yeah, I'm I was going to say that's <laughs> you're a bit um, high expectations but, there. You're pretty busy. Yeah, but but uh, anyway, I'm, I'm always I'm always open to to people asking anything. Um, 
anything be related or any questions you might have I'm happy to. So. Great, okay. And as I said um, right at, at the beginning of the webinar, we the, these uh, webinars are recorded and they are uploaded onto the council website um, within a week or two. And and then uh, if you just s search them, you'll be able to, uh, to they're a tremendous educational resource that we have. So we're very, very lucky that we'll be doing this and um, happy to share the information. So uh, I think that is, is probably, oh, one more. Do bees pollinate other plants such as the plants that we eat? Like for example, uh, like the example that you gave about the uh, cacao plant. So, Yes, they do. Alex, do you want to yeah. talk about? Yeah, they do. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, I mentioned buzz pollination um, uh, in, in the talk. So, you know, tomatoes, capsicums, uh, eggplants, kiwi fruits, all those type of things um, are, are bee pollinated primarily, and they, um, they utilize bee pollination, uh, buzz pollination to do that. Uh, so, so, yeah, the, you know, bee, bees, commercially speaking, are, are probably the most important um, pollinator. Not the only one, but, uh, but amongst the most important. Okay. Um, all right, well, I think that that's probably it. We can probably wrap it up there, everybody. I will, um, there's no more questions. Um, so I hope you enjoyed this morning. Uh, and uh, thank you very much again, Alex, for all that information. No problem. Okay. All right, I will, um, so. We're going to leave the webinar now so that people can get on with the rest of their day. Thanks for joining <laughs> us, everyone. Yeah, thank you very much.